are with us. Let's stand together and worship. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung upon that cross and he rose up from that grave. My God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We were the beggars. We were the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Cause we were the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. We shout out your
the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth, and I will daily lift my hands, for I will always sing of when your love came down. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love sing of your love forever. I could 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 sing of your love You can be seated. It's good to see everybody this morning as we gather for worship. Uh, to those of you who are joining us in person, obviously, and to those who are joining us online as well. Uh, if you're a guest with us online, we'd love to connect with you, especially if it's your first time. You can leave us a comment in the chat box or shoot us an email uh, so that we can connect with you that way. If you're a guest with us in person, there should be a connection card not too far away from you. You can fill that out and put that in the offering plate. Um, as uh, it comes around later this morning. I'm thankful to be able to gather in this place and to lift the, the name of Jesus high together. And so we're, we're thankful to be together. Harlow wanted, me, Harlow wanted to come up with, the, with me this morning to say good morning. So now she's a little bashful. That's okay. All right. Well, I tell you what, why don't we bow our heads and close our eyes and pray together uh, as we continue to worship this morning. God, we thank you so much for this time that you've given us to gather in this place and in other places as well as we worship. Whether we're here in person or joining online from somewhere else, we are thankful to be able to gather together to lift high the name of Jesus. And this morning we pray that we would do that and that we would worship in spirit and in truth, that we would make much of Christ and the songs we sing and the things we say and the things we do and the way we love one another. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Today our Lenten reflection is um, incorrect in the, in the bulletin. It is about the cup and the bread today. We continue our exploration of Lenten imagery this morning at the Last Supper. The bread and the cup are items that are very familiar to us in our Christian journey. But never were they more in focus than in the upper room at that particular Passover feast. A small room, 13 men and a few women, a crowded table indeed. I believe the most beautiful scene I regularly lay my eyes on is the people of God gathered around a communion table. The sacrament has meant many things during my life. When I was young, I believed the bread and the wine were a magical means of salvation. During high school, they were only cooked dough and fermented grapes. However, as I have matured, I have come to understand that the loaf and the cup are the gifts of God for the people of God. The liturgy says, the Lord's Supper is a feast of remembrance, communion, and hope. As we eat and drink, remember the sacrifice of suffering made by Jesus on the cross for the sin of the whole world. But we also are communing in the present tense with God through the elements that nourish our faith and become a visible display of the unity we have with one another in Jesus Christ. And we look forward. We experience a foretaste of the togetherness, peace, and blessing we will enjoy when Jesus comes again and when we see him face to face. We cannot see God, but we know he lives and reigns by his spirit. Likewise, we are drawn to the communion table by the same spirit. We grow closer to God and to each other as we share the elements of bread and the cup. Would the children come down for children's message? your voice today. I'm Allison. If you don't know, I'm glad to be here with you today. Well, today we're talking about some things that Chris told me about ahead of time, so I had some time to prepare, and I thought, you know what? I know a lot about bread. 
I'm a big fan of bread. I don't know. Do you like bread? It's good stuff. So I brought some bread, and I wanted to show you what kind of bread, because yeah, I don't know about you, but I'm very particular about the bread that I buy. So I have a couple of choices here. We got a Sara Lee honey wheat. You know, I don't know if you help your parents shop, but when I go shopping, there's this particular way to pick out bread. Did you know that? You got to give it a little squish. Not too much. You don't want to squish it so much that you can't make a good sandwich later, right? But it has to have enough give that it's not stale, right? It's important. You also have to look at the date. Oh, March 24th. Okay, we're good. My husband has a sneaky sense of when things are almost about to turn, so he won't eat it if he smells it. So that's important for me. I have to have like a good couple of week window. So the bread is really important, right? And then he talked about the cup. And you know, cups, there are all sorts of cups. There's like sippy cups at my house. There's, you know, I've got some big cups for water, but you know, I brought my favorite cup today. Do you want to see it? Okay. Well, it's a really important cup. Didn't know if you know this, but it's a mug. What do you usually put in a mug? Oh, super important. I don't know if your parents drink coffee, but generally it's coffee for me in the morning, and in fact, I'm not usually my best self until I've had at least half a cup, maybe more. And yeah, right? My parents understand that. Um, so this is an important cup because also it's my favorite coffee cup. And every morning, there's a battle in my house. I have this cup. I bought this cup on a trip. I personally picked it out. I was by myself on this trip. It's my cup, right? But my husband also thinks it's the perfect cup. I generally get up before he does, lucky me. So I usually get the cup first. But sometimes he gets to the coffee cup first and I say, hey, that's my cup. What are you doing with my cup? Anyway, it's a thing. It's a good cup. It has a good hold. But you know, now that I'm thinking about it, I brought all this stuff, but is that, is that what we're talking about today? It doesn't matter what kind of cup. What do you think? Can anybody share with me what we really mean by the bread in the cup? Does anybody have something that sticks in their brain? No one? Anyone? Well, let, let's see. Okay. Maybe this is a, a bread. I know it doesn't really matter the kind of bread, right? But this is a, a little prettier loaf of bread. What do we know about the bread that we celebrate at communion? Does anybody have any ideas? Do you know what it represents? Well, sometimes we say, I know my daughter has sat with me, and she's like, what is this stuff going down the aisle, and why can't I have some yet? Well, it's a really important thing, and it's not so much about what type of bread or if it's grape juice or wine, but what it represents. Do you know what something, what you call something that means something different? It's called a symbol. Have you heard that word? Like in America, we have the American flag and we have an eagle, and we have things that represent our country, right? Well, in church, a really important symbol is the bread and the cup because they remind us of what Jesus did for us on the cross, right? We know that he died for us. He died for our sins. And before that happened, which we're talking about in the next few weeks, right, we found out that he had communion. He ate with his disciples, and he broke the bread. And he said, this is my body broken for you, right? So it represents his body. It's not really his body. That's weird, right? But it just helps us to remember it, right? It helps us think about what he did, which was really important because it means we get to live forever with him and we have forgiveness from sins because of his choice, right? His decision to, to give himself, right? And then the cup, right? It doesn't really matter what kind of cup. It doesn't matter what's in the cup as much as what it symbolizes, right? And, he, and when Jesus did it, it was wine and we use grape juice, but what does that remind you of? What's it supposed to remind you of? Is he? His blood, right? And it sounds weird. We're, drink we're not drinking his blood, right? We're not really. It's just supposed to remind you of that. So that way, when we take communion, it's not a snack time, right? It's not mm, a loaf of bread for a little snack in the middle of service. No, it's to help us remember what Jesus did for us on the cross, right? So you get to spend some more time with me upstairs, aren't you? Lucky. And we'll talk more about what Jesus did for us and how we can be lights for him. But let's say a quick prayer. But before we do that, I need a couple of friends. Izzy, would you take care of the cup and put it on this table back here for us? And then would you take the bread for me and put it back there? And then we'll remember this over the next few weeks. And then when we come back, we'll say a quick prayer and head upstairs. Thank you. All right, would you close your eyes and pray with me? Dear Jesus, thank you so much for this day. 
Thank you for the opportunity to worship together and to learn about what you've done for us, Lord. And thank you for this precious children who I get to share good news with, Lord, each, each time I see them, Lord. And I just pray for your blessings on this day and that we would learn from the word. In your name we pray. Amen. As we prepare for our, our time of giving, um, we're going to sing one more time. W would you stand, please, and let's, let's sing together. and every day, but he also needs us during this renovation at University Heights Baptist Church, your talents, your time, your offerings and tithes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, 
we come to you today in worship and gratitude for you have guided and blessed us. You have watched over us and placed choices in our paths. Help us to be aware of you and always be prepared for your guidance. May our tithes and offerings, monies, time, and talents be acceptable to your plan for University Heights Baptist Church and, and those impacted by our presence here at Grandin National in Springfield and beyond the city and beyond the state borders. Bless these tithes and offerings for your glory. Amen. Let's see, this morning, Julie is on her way to Florida where she's going to pick up dad and drive back. I volunteered to do that for her. I thought, you know, it'd be nice of me to go to Florida for her, but then it didn't work out that way. So we're excited to have Steve Sherrill uh, playing piano this morning. It's been so nice that we have so much talent in the church and Steve's playing this week and played a few weeks ago and Nancy Hagen next week will will uh, take that spot and it's just been a, a joy and so we're, we're thrilled to have Steve here this morning and, and Nancy next week. But for now, let's stand please and, and sing a couple of hymns together.
Matthew 25, verses 31 through 36. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people, one from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Good morning again, church. If you have your Bible with you this morning, you can turn to that chapter that Molly just read for us, Matthew 25, and we'll be in Nehemiah 5 as well as we continue to think about what it means for us to live in a world of renovation and to participate in renovation. A song that came out a few years ago by one of my favorite artists asked the question, what have I done to help? It says that the world's on fire and we just climb higher to where we no longer are bothered by the smoke and the sound of what's going on below. It's a call and a caution to not get lost or caught in our own selfish bubble. It's very easy uh, in our world and in our culture to either, to either get caught in that selfish bubble or to sit back and be cynical about the issues and the challenges and the problems that people around us are facing. It's easy for us to pretend that those people or that those problems don't exist. It's easy for us to go into a bubble and to ignore everything around us. But our Lord and our Lord's gospel call us to ask some questions of ourselves. What have I done to help? Will we be aware enough to ask ourselves that question? Will we be empathetic enough to let our hearts and our minds and our actions be moved? Will we be willing to do something? Will we notice? What have I done to help? As you know, we've been walking over these last several weeks through this process and this story of renovation and thinking specifically about how we are called to be involved in the process of renovation. Last week, uh, we, we, we talked about how renovation is more than a building. It's easy to think about it in physical terms, right? It's easy to think about renovation in terms of walls and brick and mortar, but what it really is is about people. Ministry is people more than a building. And of course, we have this beautiful building, but ministry isn't the building. People are ministry. And Nehemiah gets at that same point in the passages that we read last week and, and this week as well. In Nehemiah 5, we, we read about Nehemiah being confronted with the injustice that some of the people are facing. And Nehemiah is reminded by the circumstances, by God, by people, that ministry, in fact, is to people, and that ministry is more than brick and mortar, that it, in fact, is those people who are in need and those people who are experiencing things around him. In Nehemiah 5, I'll pick it up in verse 14, Nehemiah says this, Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah from the 20th year to the 32nd year of King Artaxerxes, Twelve years, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allowance of the governor. The former governors who were before me laid heavy burdens on the people and took food and wine from them, besides forty shekels of silver. Even their servants lorded it over the people, but I did not do so because of the fear of God. Indeed, I devoted myself to the work on this wall and acquired no land, and all my servants were gathered there for the work. Moreover, there were at my table one hundred fifty people, Jews and officials, besides those who came to us from the nations around us. Now that which was prepared for one day was one ox and six choice sheep. Also fowls were prepared for me, and every ten days skins of wine in abundance. Yet with all this, I did not demand the food allowance of the governor because of the heavy burden of labor on the people. Remember for, for my good, O oh my God, all that I have done for this people. 
Nehemiah doesn't stop his work on the wall. He doesn't stop his work that is before him with brick and mortar. But he also doesn't let that consume him to the point that he is going to let people be used and abused and let people go by without trying with everything that he can to meet their needs. He's only taking what he absolutely needs and nothing more because he's concerned not just about his work, the physical labor of his work and how other people are participating in that, but he's concerned with people, with people and how they're doing, that it's more than bricks and mortar. He's concerned with the injustice that people are feeling and experiencing. He's concerned with people's response to that and he has this willingness to see and to feel, to empathize with these people who are, are, are simply doing the best that they can, and yet they are left out and left behind, and he has a willingness to respond to them, that it's more than just the work on the wall. That doesn't mean that we don't care, and that he doesn't care about the building that's going on. Nehemiah is focused on his project. He's focused on what God has called him to do. He's focused on the vision that he had in Nehemiah 1 and 2, what he asked to go back for. But as he looks at his work and as he looks at the people that surround him, he seems to be reminded by God that people are paramount to any brick and mortar. That people created in the image of God are paramount to any brick and mortar project. And Nehemiah shows us that we can care and that we can serve people first and foremost while working on these other physical projects too, but that people's needs are paramount to anything else. Nehemiah shows us that, and we have this chapter of Scripture from Matthew 25, and that's really where I want us to focus this morning. When we get to Matthew 25, Jesus is in the midst of talking about the end times. And have you noticed in Scripture that Jesus makes it perfectly clear, Jesus makes it perfectly clear that the day and the hour when He is going to return and set all things right are unknown. You notice how Jesus says that? Makes it very clear that it is unknown. But that doesn't stop people now, and that didn't stop people then from being totally consumed by the end times and the details and the charts and the pre-trib and post-trib and no-trib and it's all exhausting and it's all wasteful and it all puts energy and passion and investment in these misguided places that don't amount really to anything. Jesus says, I'm coming again and I'm going to set things right for all. One day, Jesus says, but, but don't worry about when. But the win of the end is really big business. And people were consumed by it then, and they're consumed by it now. Go to any Christian bookstore, and the best section of any Christian bookstore is books about the end times. Every two or three years, every major preacher in the United States of America will come out with a new book about the end times because books about the end times make money. People are consumed by it. We get enamored by it. And Jesus, in my own paraphrase, this is not, you will not find these words in Scripture, I don't think, but Jesus, in my own paraphrase, says, knock it off. You've got more important things to do. Jesus seems, seems to say, in my own condensed paraphrase, cut it out, stop trying to escape everything, because I've got places for you to go, and I've got love for you to experience, and I have people for you to serve. It's apples and oranges, and I didn't print it out. It's on my phone, so I'm not texting anybody while I'm preaching. I'm looking at a picture. It's apples and it's oranges. Well, now I can't find it. Never mind. That's why I should print it out, see? It's apples and it's oranges. But when C.S. Lewis was thinking about the way the world was in the middle of the Cold War when everybody was afraid that somebody was going to drop an atomic bomb on everybody else, he encouraged people not to live in fear and not to try to escape and not to let countries and people in power have that power over them, but instead to live life to its absolute fullest. 
Jesus teaches us to live, even in the rough and the tough and the hard, to live in the absolute fullness of life. And that, that can be hard, and that's probably really easy for me to say in my comfort and in a life that in so many words is really, really easy. I can't imagine being on the other side of the world in a place like Ukraine today or for the last two and a half weeks and saying those same words. But even in that place, just in the last couple of weeks, I've heard stories of, of people not allowing that sort of thing to rule over them in the midst even of death and violence and chaos. I saw a picture of a newborn baby yesterday born in Kiev. A week and a half ago, in the midst of rubble and all of the unknown of what the future might look like, I saw a picture shared by a pastor in Ukraine who was officiating a wedding ceremony between two young newlyweds. Reminders, little earthly reminders that ultimately evil will not win and that good will triumph. And it now and in eternity because God has already won the victory. A reminder that goodness and love and life and holiness win. And so if we know the ultimate, if we know the ultimate outcome of the story, we don't get tied up in the details of that. And we know that we are called to work for good and for life and for the gospel instead of looking for a way to escape, instead of looking for a way to escape this life that we have been given. And we're called to participate in this journey of renovation. Matthew 25, not just the, the passage that Molly read for us earlier this morning, but the entire chapter points to where Matthew 25 ends. And we're not going to read the whole chapter together, don't worry. You can read that on your own. But there's three pieces, really, three sections to Matthew 25. We have the parable of the ten bridesmaids, and we have the parable of the talents. And then the last half of the chapter, we get to the judgment of the nations. And if there's three things that I want you to remember as we leave here this morning in just a little bit, it's these three things. That as we participate in renovation, we're called to be ready. We're called to invest ourselves, and we're called to serve the first third of Matthew 25 is about being ready. It's this story of the ten bridesmaids. They're there. They're waiting on the groom, and five of them, of course, have oil and plenty of wick to wait on the groom, and five of them haven't prepared at all. They're not ready. It's a reminder to us, a call to us to be ready, to, to not waste the opportunity that we've been given, to be ready to do what you have been called to do and be be ready to do what you have been designed to do. Five of the bridesmaids missed it because they forgot their purpose and they forgot their mission. We don't need to miss out because we forgot the mission was exactly what God called us to do. And we phrase that in different ways at different times. But we've said it a lot recently in this way, by living the gospel and loving the city and being the church, that we don't miss out because we forgot that ministry is to people. And so we're, we need to remain ready as we participate in renovation. And we need to be ready by investing ourselves in the kingdom, by taking calculated risk for the kingdom, and sometimes even uncalculated risk for the kingdom. That this is what it looks like. We have, of course, the parable of the talents in the middle third of chapter 25. And it, Jesus is calling us to think about how we're really investing ourselves. How we're, how we're investing our talent, how we're investing our time, how we're investing our dollars, how we're investing all of us, and how we might be taking calculated risks for the kingdom of God. Jesus seems to be telling us that the absolute worst thing we can do, the absolute worst thing we can do is, that, is just to sit there. Just to sit there and be stuck. To sit there and not do anything. To sit there and exist. To sit there and survive. Jesus is calling us to do more than exist. He's calling us to do more than survive. He's calling us into the fullness of life as people, as families, as a church, to invest ourselves and our families and our church into the kingdom of God, into something bigger than ourselves, 
something bigger than me, something bigger than my family, and even for our church, we're not simply investing in University Heights Baptist Church. We are investing in taking risk for the kingdom of God. It is not for the church, it's for the kingdom. The church might benefit from that, but that it's for the kingdom of God, and so we invest our lives and all of us, every bit of us, into the kingdom. And the last thing is this, that we are called in this process of renovation, we are called to serve Jesus. And I know that's probably patently obvious to all of us. But we are called to serve Christ together. Jesus makes it very clear in Matthew 25 that we are called to serve people in need. That if we do it for anyone in need, that we have done it for Jesus. That if we serve somebody in need, that we have served Jesus. That if we feed a hungry person, that we have fed a hungry Jesus. That if we give water to a thirsty person, that we have given water to a thirsty Jesus. That if we visit someone, that we have visited Jesus. Jesus calls us in this world to be His presence, to be the presence of Christ, to serve others who are made in the image of God. I know that we all feel this sense of division in our culture that has been there for a long time but seems to continue to grow and grow and grow. This gulf between everybody and the things that divide us where we stand on issues can be so divisive. And of course, the church has had its own struggles with this. I don't mean this church. I mean every church has had its own struggles with this for centuries over the way to live out faith. And so we read Matthew 25, and some people, some people find themselves at this question, should we be more focused on saving souls or meeting people's physical needs? Which is a false dichotomy because Jesus did both. He didn't say one or the other. It was both and, both and. Jesus cared deeply about the poor and about the downtrodden, demonstrating his compassion for people in tangible ways, giving sight to the blind, touching the leper, healing the sick, turning a little boy's lunch into food for thousands of people. But he also preached the good news of God's love and salvation, and following Jesus means both of those things. He instructed his followers to change the world in his name, by embracing two essential commands, the Great Commandment and the Great Commission. And so we're called to love God and to love our neighbors as ourselves and to go and to make disciples who will then go and make more disciples, literally participating in God's work of renovation. And it really can be tempting for us as people who feel more comfortable in one camp or the other to choose that one piece. Right? I'll go with the Great Commandment, but I won't worry about the Great Commission. Or I'll choose the Great Commission, but I'm not so sure about the Great Commandment. Jesus doesn't give us that option. He says it's both and. And in Matthew 25, we see that more than anywhere else. In Matthew 25, we see the shocking depth of Jesus' love for everybody. Not for some people, not for some nations. Not for some groups of people, not for those who already believe and are followers, but for every single person. Because every single person is created in the image of God. And his identification with the least of these is so profound that when we reach out to people, when we allow ourselves to see people who are in pain, to see people who are in need, when we allow ourselves to see them and to reach out to them with love and enter their pain, it is Jesus himself who we are serving and who we are embracing, who we are loving. And so it's not either or, it's both and. The great commandment and the great commission. We love people and we serve people. We participate in the process of renovation. And then as God allows and as God works in people's hearts and minds, we tell them about the reason that we do that. Matthew 25 becomes our to-do list, so to speak. Hunger and thirst and alienation and lack of clothes and poor health and injustice. Caring for people in this way signals 
whose side we're on, so to speak, the side of God who desperately loves each and every person. And God invites us, commissions us, ordains us to participate and to be his agents of renovation in the world. And so we gather for worship. We gather to fellowship. We gather to study scripture together. But a huge piece of the work of, the, of renovation, in fact, I would say the biggest piece of the works of renovation that we participate in in people's lives doesn't happen within the walls of this building. It doesn't happen simply on Sunday morning or on Wednesday night. It happens on Monday afternoon and Wednesday morning and Friday night as we live out our calling to be God's agents of renovation in the world. Would you stand and bow your heads and close your eyes and let's pray together before we sing our song of response. And with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I want to encourage you to respond to God and how He's speaking to you this morning. Maybe it's simply asking God to make you more aware. To be more aware of the people around you who are in need. To be more aware of the people around you who are hurting. Maybe it's to ask some questions about who God is and what it means to follow Jesus. Or maybe it means making this place, this church, your home. God, we're thankful for your presence with us as we worship and as we reflect and ponder your word. Help us, Lord, to be agents of renovation, not simply within the walls of this building, but in our lives as families, in our places of work, in our places of influence. Help us to be agents of renovation for your glory and for your kingdom. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. before we uh, dismiss this morning. I uh, want to remind you that we'll have our budget discussion this uh, Wednesday night at 6 o'clock, so there's no Bible study going on uh, and no youth or children's ministry going on this week during spring break also. Um, if you are a, a parent with kids in grade school or you're a schmedium adult, like we termed it last week, uh, sign up for a trip to Tommy Hawks. We're going to try out axe throwing. That sign-up sheet is in the um, is in the narthex, and there will be child care for, uh, uh, for there will be child care going on here at the church at that time. Um, and then if you would like to order a yard sign um, for Easter, that, that uh, sign-up sheet is in the narthex too. We'll order those tomorrow, so today's the last day to sign up for those. And just uh, really quickly want to make sure and invite you next week right after church, we're going to have a reception in the fellowship hall uh, put on by the Searchers um, Life Group 
for Harlan Spurgeon, who will be moving to be closer to one of his daughters in St. Louis. So he'll be leaving us pretty soon, and we want to say goodbye to him. That'll take place right after church next week. Okay? Let's sing together, and we'll be dismissed. Thank you.